Are you free? Man, that's a great, incredible song. Man, I love the gospel that is sung in that song, that we are free. That the Lord Jesus has come to give us freedom. We're going to be in Acts chapter 21 this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn over there. I want to take a few moments, though, and I want to talk about why we've been in this series. We've been in the book of Acts, coming up on chapter 21. We call the series Unhindered. The reason we did that is because we want to be free in Christ. The word, the Greek word for unhindered is the very last Greek word in the entire book of Acts, akaluto. I know that doesn't mean anything to you, but it means unhindered. It means that we are free in Christ, that we have been set free, we've been forgiven, that the Lord wants us to proclaim him with all boldness. The scripture says without hindrance. Is that the way that we live? Is that what we are experiencing? The reason we're walking through the book of Acts is because It's a recording of real events. This is not theory. These are people who are experiencing God. They're experiencing his freedom. They're experiencing his power. They're experiencing his forgiveness. And we're watching the Lord come in and take a small group of people and radically change the world, taking them and displaying in and through them his power and his presence. It is about the power of the Holy Spirit that we're experiencing through the book of Acts and we're seeing the Lord break down barriers. We see the Lord invading people's lives and rescuing them, delivering them, bringing freedom and seeing what this life looks like, a life that is truly unhindered. And that's what we wanna be as a church. That's who we wanna be personally. We want to be a church that is ready to follow the Lord, no matter what he asks from us, that we want to know him and follow him. And that's why this passage this morning is so key, because it's about doing the will of the Lord. It's about saying, Lord, I know what you want from me, and I'm ready to do what you want and how that is possible possible in our own lives, possible in the life of the Apostle Paul, even though everyone around us may be saying, don't do that. The Lord is saying, are you going to follow me or are you going to follow man? So in the honor of God's word, if you would stand with me this morning, Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse number three, where Paul is beginning this finishing strong, where he is now making his way a journey to Jerusalem. Verse number three. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left and sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there was the ship was to unload his cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go unto Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with our wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When he had finished the voyage from Tyre, they arrived at Poltamus, and we greeted the brothers. And stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, 
we come before you this morning to do your will, to know you. Father, please reveal to us that which is keeping us from you. Father, may you please have your way with us. May we be honest about where we stand before you this morning. May we be honest about things that are keeping us from you. Father, may we truly, with sincerity, bow before you, experience the newness of life that is in you. Lord, we pray. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we will experience your salvation, your deliverance, your renewal, your healing, and that, Lord, we will be truly be changed, men and women, this morning. We pray for this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. This passage continues to follow the journey of Paul. He is making his way to Jerusalem and he is visiting previous places that he's already been, places where God has formed a church, places where he's seeing God at work and he's stopping and he's meeting with different groups of disciples. Last week we saw that he met with the elders of Ephesus and we saw what the Lord was communicating through Paul to them. And here we have the same situation where he's meeting with different disciples in different locations and he's meeting some resistance. He's also meeting some reality of what is awaiting for him in Jerusalem. But the key, the key to this passage is that very last phrase there in verse number 14. It says, let the will of the Lord be done. This, there's only one point to the sermon. Let the will of the Lord be done. Let God's will, let his desires, let his direction, let his plan be done. Here's the key. Do we know what it is? And are we willing to follow? Do we know what God wants? Do we know where he's leading us? And are we willing to obey? Are we willing to lay it all down? That's the, that is the ultimate question. What does the Lord want? He wants us. He wants his will to be done. He wants us to know and follow him. You know that's the phrase that we use here at church all the time. In that knowing means he wants a relationship with us. In that following, he desires for us to be obedient to him. And I'm telling you, to do the will of the Lord, there are two things that are absolutely necessary that we're gonna see unfold from this particular passage. And that is, one, your identity must be found in Christ and in Christ alone. Up here on the screen. And number two is that you must have a clear step towards Christ. To do the will of the Lord, those two things must happen. You must have a clear identity in Christ and you must have a clear next step towards Christ. He will always lead you. Hear me very closely. He will always lead us to himself and he's calling us to follow him. Because Paul meets tremendous resistance here. And if his identity is not first found in Christ, if he's not secure in his identity in Christ, there is no way he is going to be able to follow and do the will of the Lord. Let's take a look back in the scriptures with me. Let's take it back. And I know I'm, I'm running on the PowerPoint guys here. So follow me. Let's come back to verse number four. It says, and having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And listen to this. Through the spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. And then let's jump and let's go all the way to, to, uh, to Agabus there in verse number 10. And while they were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Let's remember a couple of things. These people loved Paul. They loved him. They didn't want to see anything negative happen to him. They didn't want to see anything bad take place 
in his life. And through the Spirit, God is revealing to Paul the difficult things that he is about to walk into. None of what they're saying plays out to be wrong. It all plays out to be right. We are going to see exactly what they say about Paul, about being bound up, about being chained, about being imprisoned, about losing his freedom, experiencing conflict. It's all going to happen. The Holy Spirit, God is giving him a preview of what is about to happen in his life. And he has a decision to make. Am I willing to walk into that difficult situation? And how is it even possible to walk into that difficult situation? Because what you're about to see is that Paul's identity in Christ trumps his circumstances. Hear that, people. Hear that. Write that down. You better tweet it out. You know what I'm saying? Christ and the identity that we receive from him is greater than anything we will experience in this world, positive or negative. Paul is saying to us, the supremacy of Christ is greater. His, my relationship with him is greater. And he even pointed back to it back in chapter 20. Look at chapter 20, verse 24, up on the screen for you. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Think about this very first phrase. I do not account my life to be of any value nor precious to myself. How can he say something like that? It's because Paul's got low self-esteem? It's because he just doesn't really understand the value of life? No. He makes this statement based upon the value of Jesus. He understands the supremacy of Jesus. He understands the value of his relationship with him. He's able to have a proper view of his life because of the greatness of his. Whoa. He's able to say, I understand the value of Christ. I mean, look at Philippians chapter three. Look at the way he assesses everything that he's achieved in this world. And he achieved a lot in this world. But compared to Jesus, what does he say about all the accomplishments that he's achieved in this world? He says they're garbage. They're trash compared to him. What he's saying in this passage, what he's saying to all those who are telling him not to go to Jerusalem, he's saying to them, Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. All that you're pointing out to me are losses, losses in this world, loss of freedom, loss of peace. Hear me, but what he's saying is that I've already have those in Christ and you can't take it away from me. Do you hear the comeback? Come back to the passage. Come back to what he responds in verse number 13. And then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart because he loved them. For I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. For the name of the Lord Jesus. He knows in whom he has believed. It says in 2 Timothy. But he also knows in whom he is following and obeying. And he says, I'm willing to die for his name. Why? Because his identity, he has a clear identity in Christ. Is that where you get your identity? Is that where I get my identity? Is my identity secure in Jesus, in Jesus alone? Or... Is it possible that actually my identity is coming from the things of the world, where we compare ourselves to one another based upon our stuff, based upon our careers, our education, and there's this constant comparison, and there's either a gain or a loss based upon how other people perceive or treat me. Is that how we live? Is this where we're gaining our identity? Because if you're gaining your identity from the world, you are lost. And your life 
There is a rotten core in the center of your heart and it is destroying you. This week, I told you a couple weeks ago that I've identified that there are several trees on my property that are ash trees, they're dying of disease. And so finally we just made that leap to find someone come in and take them all down, right? To get them out of there. They took a huge one down in my front yard. And when they did, in slicing that tree open, this is this what it looked like in the middle of that tree. Let me tell you this, that's not what it should look like, right? That's disease. That's rot in the middle. Literally, I took my hand and I just pressed it right through the middle of that piece of wood. That's not how a tree should be. Our lives are very close to reflecting this. When our lives are not found in Christ, when we are not surrendered to him, when we are just trying to find ourselves in the things of this world, we are rotten to the core. Disease is inside of us and it's rotting us from the inside out. That's what Jesus says. That's what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about you guys are so focused on the outside appearance. He says, no, evil comes from the inside. You are rotten from the inside. And the Lord has come to do what? Redeem and deliver us to give us a new identity. That's why he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You are a new creation in Christ. The old is past and the new has come. Is our identity fully found in Christ and Christ alone? I'm telling you, that's how Paul is able to say, I'm ready to go and be imprisoned. I'm ready to go die in the name of Jesus because my identity is secure in Christ. All that they were pointing out as loss, he's saying, I'm not focused on the loss. I'm focused on the gain. I'm focused on Jesus. I'm focused on to live is good, but to die is what? Is gain. He gets it all in Christ. His identity is secure in him. And he is able to now follow clearly exactly what God wants for his life because he's focused on Jesus and not the things of this world. This world is choking us out. This world is hurting us in our pursuit of Jesus. We are so enamored with the things of this world. We're so enamored with people of this world. We're so enamored with just all that this world has to offer. And I'm telling you, there's only one king. There's only one who can give us peace that defies understanding. There's only one who can give us an access to the throne of God. And his name is Jesus. Paul is saying, you're so worried about being bound up. I'm not bound up. It doesn't matter even if they imprison me. It doesn't matter if they try to limit my access. I have access to the king and that cannot be taken away from me. Hear that. Because we're obsessed, whether you know it or not, we are obsessed with access. This week, this week I got caught up in access. This week, and I don't say this, please hear me. I don't say this to like boast. This is just a reality. I was invited this week. I don't know why I was invited this week with a group of pastors to go to the White House. And so, you know what? I don't care who's in the presidency. Guess what? You give me an opportunity to go and pray for the president, I'm gonna pray. I don't care who's in there, right? You know what I'm saying? And so you're gonna give me access. Do you know what it takes to get into the White House? Holy smokes. I mean, there is a pre, all these different forms. You gotta give them all your information. You get there, you go through so many layers of security. It's ridiculous the way that they, they usher you in. It's so bad that when we were in this meeting, we we're in this meeting with pastors and the vice president is about to come in and he's coming in. Two of our group decide to go to the restroom. Guess who was not allowed back in that room? You know what I'm saying? Like they got shut out because they went to the restroom. They couldn't hold it. You know what I'm saying? Bad move, right? And so. Here we are though, in the midst of power, in the midst of the greatest nation in the world, the people who represent freedom, he's just a man. We are just men and women and we sell ourselves out over what we think of one another. Who cares? There's only one opinion that matters. And his name is Jesus. And he has come to redeem us. He has come to save us. 
He has come to usher us into the kingdom that never ends. He gives us immediate access. There's no security form with him. He's opened it all up. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. I love you. I created you. Man, I want you. And Paul is saying, my identity is secure in Christ. It doesn't matter what man does to me. I'm ready to follow my king wherever he says for me to go. That's the freedom that is in Christ. That is the peace that he settles in our heart. We have all of him. And he cries out, follow me. Come to me. Man, I want to show you who I am. It doesn't matter. Even if I'm asking you to do hard things, I'm going to be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How incredible is that? And not only are we called upon to have a clear identity in Christ, but we are called upon to have a clear step towards Christ. What did Paul know? What did he know? What did he say? I must go to Jerusalem. That was his clear step. That's what he knew what God was calling him to do. He was called to go to Jerusalem. And what's the scripture say? When they understood that, when they got that, and since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, what's he say? Let the will of the Lord be done. If your identity is in Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit resides within you, God has made his home in you personally. There's a beautiful gift that the Lord has given to us through the Holy Spirit called conviction. And the Lord uses conviction to place our focus upon him and him alone. What is the step that the Lord is calling upon you to take this morning towards him? What is it that he's calling upon you right now and saying, are you willing to obey me out of conviction, out of love? Are you ready to take a step towards me? And what is that step? Is it a step away from hurt, away from grief, away from disappointment, frustration, bondage, just your thought life, conduct. What is it right now the Lord is saying, you need to step away from that and take a step towards me, to trust me, to put those things away, to focus it on me and to understand that I'm calling you to myself. I have the power to free you. I have the power to forgive you. I have the power to restore you. Are you ready to take a step towards me? Are you ready to trust me with your life? Are you ready to say, Lord Jesus, it's all you. I'm ready to take a step towards you. I'm ready to surrender to you. That which is holding me back. I'm telling you, there's no way, personally and corporately, we are gonna live the life that God has called us to live to be unhindered until we're ready to surrender it all to him. No way. And there's so many of us who are here this morning and our testimonies are just like Allison that we heard this morning. You know the right information. You know it. If somebody came to you right now and said, tell me, how does someone get saved? Tell me about Jesus. You would have the right information, but you've never actually followed him. You've never embraced him, I think is the word that she used. She, is not, she was not living for him. That testimony is common in our world. And the Lord is rooting that out. And he's saying, are you really gonna follow me? Are you really gonna surrender to me? Are you gonna let me change your life or are you just gonna be about a set of information that doesn't actually transform you at all? Because we were made for a relationship. Is your identity in Christ clearly? And are you ready to take a clear step towards him? This is about God's will. He's calling you. 
He's revealing to you. That's why we come to his word. Lord, what is your will? And I'm telling you, he is calling you to himself. And are you ready to put aside that which hinders and to experience the freedom that is in Jesus and in Jesus alone? Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we come to you. And Father, we come to you humbly and we come to you in a moment of response. Will all heads bowed and eyes closed. This is about Jesus right now. This is about a response. This is not, this is not, this is not about anything else or distractions. This is about Jesus. Do you know him? Do you really know him? If you wanna know Jesus, the scripture says to believe, believe in him. That means trust in him. Follow him and him alone. And the scripture has a, a way for you to do that in Romans 10, 9. The scripture says, if you confess with your mouth, I mean, confess out loud that Jesus is Lord and you believe, you trust him, and you believe in his resurrection. You believe that he's alive today. The scripture says you will be saved. Verse number 13 just says simply in Romans 10, 13, if you believe, you will be saved. Jesus has already paid your price. He has already done it for you. He is offering to you this beautiful gift of salvation, this new identity in Christ. Will you surrender your life to him? If you wanna take that step of surrender to him this morning, I'm gonna ask for you to pray a prayer after me where you are this morning. Right there where you are seated to pray this prayer. Nothing special about this prayer. It is simply a way to voice what the Lord is doing in your life right now. Pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, Lord, I ask right now, Lord, I ask for the forgiveness of sin. And Lord, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord this morning. And I believe in my heart, Lord, that you died for my sin. And I believe in my heart that you arose again from the dead. And I believe in my heart that you give me forgiveness and the newness of life. And Lord, I surrender my life to you this morning. And I pray for this in the name of Jesus. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I'm gonna ask for you to raise your hand where you are. If you prayed that prayer, raise your hand where you are. Don't be shy. Thank you, several of you. Wow, a lot of you across this room. Amen. The rest of you here this morning, if you are a believer in Christ, what's your next step towards him? What is the Lord asking you to do? Is he asking you to walk away from something that's holding you back? Is he asking you this morning to go and to share the gospel with someone around you? What is that next step towards the Lord that he's calling to you this morning? Lord Jesus, give us the strength and the courage to respond, to not hold back. Father, to really pray this morning, to lay our lives down before you this morning. Father, to let you have your way with us this morning. Father, we just pray you will do a beautiful, perfect, eternal work this morning in us. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus.